Okay, so welcome. It takes an old but still reliable computer. That's what the, the new Leon, the second generation. The second Leon. There is a Bolsch, no? As the Uredo. Yeah. Uh, so the second generation of today's operating nuclear plants is closing to 40 years. It will be extended to 60 and maybe 80 years of life. So they will be old and reliable. Like my, my computer is old and reliable. Now does reliable mean safe? To some extent, yes, there is a correlation. It's not a causation. Okay, so reliable things tend to be safe or at least predictable and predictable is also safe. Think about that. If it, if you can figure out what's going on, then you are in good mode. So we'll continue today the discussion of about uh, two hours, uh, the concepts of uh, nuclear safety. How do we design for safety? What does it take together and so on? Before jumping into the Uh, into the, the topics of nuclear safety, let's discuss the, the seminars for tomorrow. For those who are here and those who are at home, this is the Zoom link. You have it in your emails already, so we'll only do it on Zoom, not here in person. Uh, the great is simple, pass, no pass. So you do the seminar, you don't do the seminar, that's easy. Uh, I suggest that we go for about 10 minutes for foreign countries. So we have four students from foreign countries. That would be the first hour more or less, because for us, it would be a little bit interesting what happens outside. And then for the rest, for Slovenians, about five minutes each. Uh, we discussed last time that you share a little bit to go around with topics, not don't, don't talk about the same thing, try to, try to make it a little bit around, okay. Email slides to me tonight before tomorrow morning or and a copy to Mitya Urshic uh, so we can roll the slides for you. We don't lose time with screen sharing, switching, stuff like that. I think we'll go alphabetically first, first the, the foreigners and then the Slovenians just to have some information. If there are any late presentations, it could happen somebody will it will be not available tomorrow, something like that. We'll probably do it in January, maybe before if we have time, but probably in January. I still recommend that you send in the, the slides, even if you're not here. So if you show up tomorrow, that's okay. If you don't show up tomorrow, then the slides are around and we do it next time. Um, anybody has any objections about recording the session on the Zoom? We'll then publish it like I published these lectures. It's free now on YouTube. Anybody can look at it. So that's fine. If somebody has a reservation, please email me also tonight before tomorrow morning. Good. Then we go to what we'll discuss in these two hours today. We'll repeat a little bit what are fundamental safety functions. I'm telling it a few times so to show that it's really what you need to know at any time. <laughs> what are typical safety goals? What are what is defense in depth? And what uh, plant states correspond somehow to the different defense in depth levels? And then we'll go into ma major safety design principles. And after we have an idea how to design the nuclear safety uh, systems, then we'll go to see the typical systems uh, which are uh, available today in generation two, generation three. Generation four is in the development, so we can skip that. The principles will be more or less the same. Maybe I will touch a little bit on the go on some, some peculiars. So please remember the three fundamental safety functions, control of reactivity, cooling or removing the heat and containing 
or confining the nuclear materials. If you can do all of them, you are on the safe side. So first you need to control the reactivity, then you go from 100% nominal power down, down to less than seven, but you stay with residual heat. So you will have to cool it nearly forever. Actively or passively, no, that's the question. It's not the question if you need to cool or not. Because the amount of heat, let me repeat that in the core, in the, core the amount of heat released by natural uh, disintegration or uh, of the, of the uh, elements or radionuclides there is enough to melt it if it's not cooled. And if you are not cooling, then you lose the confinement. It's kind of correlated in a way because the, all of the materials we know are sensitive to temperature. So where, where do you think, where is the limit of our materials, uh, pitch temperature? You cannot really rely on any materials. Yeah, technically even at about ceramics, which is not good for pressurized components of pressurized uh, reactors because they are very brittle. So, uh, and in the turbo machinery on the earth or in fusion reactors, where, where do you think, which are the temperatures? Well, that's the temperature of the plasma, but materials. So the gas turbines in airplanes and elsewhere would be good 1,000, good 1,100 with cooling already. Uh, if you go up with temperature, you increase the thermodynamic efficiency, but you also decrease the, the material stability. So you have to cool it somehow. And also for the fusion, first of all, it will be roughly 1,000 or even less. For high temperature reactors of generation four, everybody, is looking for solutions below, let's say 700 if possible. If you look at the conventional coal or thermal power plants, also the temperatures would be roughly 600 or something like that, the limiting, maybe 700, but that's about, about it. Actually for a feeling, uh, it's a piece of information uh, so, uh, in Slovenian the coal power plant Shostan, they have about 100 meters long tubes in the in the uh, heating chamber where the the coal is burning, and from 20 to 600 degrees they extend for a few meters. Okay, so you have to compensate for this extension somehow. That's part of the problem of high temperature materials. So, uh, and after that they they melt. If you melt the, the, the pressure vessel, then nothing stays inside. It just goes around. So cooling and confinement are always very, very connected. If you don't cool, you will never confine. Okay. The safety goals related somehow to the, to the levels of defense, if you want, is to control the normal operation is the first one. The second one is to control abnormal events and also control postulated design basis accidents. Postulated, we say, because the designers assumed this type of accidents will happen. So we designed the machine for it. And if the first and the second don't work, the third one is to prevent or mitigate beyond design accidents, like core melt with in the order of one per 10,000 years would be typically expected or one per 100,000 years. And large or early release, which is one order of magnitude, uh, lower frequency, which is accepted. And this would be one in a million years, roughly. When you get sufficient amount of radioactivity outside for the people uh, in neighboring villages, they have to react somehow probably evacuate. There are other ways of reacting also. Okay, defense in depth, two looks at it. First is uh, multiple barriers, porous ceramic fuel, contains the fission products. Second one is fuel cladding, where the uh, ceramic tablets are usually stacked in. If you see one is kind of a tablet and then 
two is the uh, fuel cladding around it. The third one is reactor coolant pressure boundary, the boundary of the blue area in the screen. The, the fourth one is internal containment and the fifth one is external containment. In Kershko, the number four is made of steel in some designs, French designs, both are um, concrete. So you will see different solutions uh, around the world, but okay. And this one, where I think I can hide this uh, part of the story. It's a kind of a summary of everything about defense in depth and plant operational states. So we have in vertical columns, five levels of defense from control or prevent to mitigate at the end. Five is mitigate, evacuate. So the objective of level one is prevent of abnormal operation and, and failure. Of level two is control of abnormal operation and def detection of failures. Level three is already blue, so it's accident. It's anticipated accident, but it's accident. Control accidents below some severity level postulated in the design basis. So we, we define, de uh, decide upfront, we defend for certain uh, events, certain magnitude of earthquakes, certain magnitude of winds, uh, water from the outside perspective. And there is something which is beyond design, which is then in red where we decided, decided in the design not to go there, but then still it's a good idea to try to manage it if it happens. So level four and level five. five. So uh, how do we achieve it? Essential features here. For level one, it's conservative design and quality of construction. For level two, it's control limiting and protection systems and other surveillance features. So you already need some systems. For level three, you have specific safety systems. They call it engineered safety features. They are there only to defend against the consequences of accidents. And then in level four, you have complementary measures like uh, I try to call it, uh, I usually call it uh, fireman equipment or mobile equipment when the engineer safety features fail, then you use whatever you have handy to cool, to contain. And the last one is offsite emergency measures being uh, evacuation and stuff like that. Uh, what's still important is that there are procedures in the plant. In the beginning I said, uh, and then I need to repeat is that safety is usually related to procedures. Operators have procedures, pilots have checklists. It's there prepared in advance how you react to certain situation. There are two reasons for that. It's very difficult to remember everything. So it's good to have a step-by-step -step procedure, do that, do this. Things don't get forgotten or something like that. So there are normal operating procedures which are used in the normal operation. You can imagine you play during the normal operation procedure like press button, increase, uh, increase flow there, decrease temperature here. Eventually you go out. There is nothing else you can do in the normal operating procedure, okay? It points, oh, now go to the emergency operating procedure. It's also a good signal to the operator, you're in trouble now. So now we are in, situation which demands a little bit more. So they go into the emergency operating procedures and then they try to solve it. And if they are successful, it's okay. If they are not successful, they drop out to another set of procedures which are sometimes called severe accident management guidelines or something like that. And uh, in this part is you know, when you go out of emergency procedures, where the improvisation comes to the to the play to and creativity of solutions comes to play before its procedures. 
Okay, it also has kind of related conditions of barrier barriers, which is uh, now in the red zone, uh, sorry, in the green zone, everything is okay. You can have certain small damage of fuel, of fuel, uh, uh, how did we call it? The tube of the fuel, it's the, sorry? Well, you can have tube rupture or a failure of the of the tube or a circular tube uh, up to let's say roughly one percent or something like that, which is still considered being inside the normal operation. But then, if you have more severe fuel failure, you are already in trouble. And then there could be severe fuel damage. Severe fuel damage means either a lot of fuel uh, tube ruptured or already one set of melting. And then you get into Rizna, uh, into serious fuel melt at the end of the day, if you go towards the level five. This is kind of the uh, overview table. It calls the green one normal operation, the blue one postulated accidents, postulated not, it means they didn't really happen. They were assumed in the design. Uh, some of them actually happened but after they were assumed in the design and not completely <laughs> in the same way. Okay, and then there is emergency. Emergency is when you go out of what is uh, meant, uh, mostly what is meant by the design. Okay. Just let's try to relate the defense in depth levels with some frequencies, how often this should happen or could happen to you. So, the mitigate, this is the, the level five evacuation, one in a million years or something like that would be would be a good idea. Uh, then uh, then uh, uh, for level four, which is control of severe plant conditions. So how to manage the, 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 uh, the core melt or something like that, or prevent it or to manage it should be between 10 to minus four, 10 to minus six. Reactor year is the is the unit here. And uh, for the rest, then for for level three, which is control of accidents of reasonably small accidents, from which you could recover the nuclear power plant usually, would be between one percent and 10 to minus four. And normal operation is about it's. Yeah, we had some of them last year. So th this is this is definitely core melt. Anything which leads you to core melt, and this is large early release, where you need to evacuate people, where you, you have some significant amount of uh, things out. It could be caused by a lot of things. So, and this with the recovery goes to some steam generator tube rupture or something like that, where you have uh, a, some significant piece of equipment failing, but the, the machine can recover from this situation, shut down, and then you replace the machine and goes, go, it, it goes on. This would be number three. And four and five, that's it. It's done forever. You just have to clean up. Okay. Now, after this, uh, a little bit of repeating and short introduction from the last time. Let's go to the major safety design principles. The first one is uh, your design should be resilient to a single failure. What does what do you think this means? Uh, it's not enough to know how to control, as you say. It's actually the machine needs to have an option to continue normally with, with anything, one piece of equipment being broken. Okay, whatever fails, one thing, one system, one component, you can continue. Now, in a car, 
it's closer to you. Can you imagine a car which is able to drive on four on three wheels? You have four wheels. If one fails, can you still drive? No. Well, you need to replace it in the, in the car. So it's not directly prone, but you have some, usually some, uh, some reserve with you. So you have to stop. You can repair it on the spot and you can go. There was a car, a French car, Citroën, in the 60s and 70s. It was able to drive without one of the rear wheels. OK? It was too expensive, so nobody <laughs> is using that anymore. But there was a car able to do that. Not the front wheel, but yes, without one of the, of the uh, rear wheels, OK? You can do that. Uh, now, if you would like to avoid single failure, probably a very good example are also power lines. Now I have to use the, you know that the big electric power lines they usually run in a closed loop. If you look at Slovenian, uh, Slovenian uh, major power lines, then it's it's a free angle. It's not a does not go that way. Let me let me put it different. One is Maribor. Another is Kursko. The third one is Beričevo which is very close to the reactor, to the trigger reactor. And these are, are 400 kilowatt lines are connected this way. This is a single failure prone system, whichever part of the one of them you break. If you break one, all the points have electricity, OK? If everything is working, everything has electricity. If you break one, either all three points still have the electricity. The rest of the country makes loops over neighboring countries. So here in, in, uh, in Europe, we are interconnected. There's no problem. So Slovi uh, the lines go to Croatia, they go to Austria, they go to Italy, and they are looped back over European systems. So we are in multiple loops. In nuclear reactors, Single failure, if you would like to control the reactivity, uh, a failure would be you lose the control rods. What do you do then? How do you stop the reactor if you lose the control rods? Inject boron. So you have another solution to do the same thing. It's called, this one is called uh, uh, diverse solutions. They have two difficult, di different physical principles to do it. We'll come to that. So to avoid single failures, what you can do, you can have redundancy. So if you would have six or eight wheels on your car, losing one would be no problem. Actually, there is a, a, a joke about the reserve wheel in the car. How many reserve well, you have one reserve uh, wheel in your car usually. For how many wheels it can be used? <laughs> or 16. <laughs> how do you come to number 16? How many, how many wheels do you have on your car? Then let me turn around the question. 16. You have two in the front, two in the back, two on left, two on the right, and you have reserve for any of them. OK? So, so you come to 16. That's not the redundancy. Don't go that way. But redundancy would mean you have, let's say, on each axis, you have three wheels. Then you can lose any one of them, and you still can drive. You would see on the trucks, the rear wheels typically are doubled, which means that you temporarily are able, or you don't lose control on the vehicle if you lose one of the tires in the double packs. But you need to replace it very soon. It does not take, it does not work for a long time. 
but still you can you can survive uh, the immediate event in in small car if you lose the tire it, it's kind of tricky sometimes especially if you are fast so redundancy the, the other one one is diversity we'll go into a little bit more details with each of them then but still diversity would mean it's connected to redundancy so you have two or three different means of achieving the goal uh, but redundancy would assume there is the same mechanism behind okay so you have one wheel uh, the same reserve wheel as for the four ones diversity could mean that you have something else you have a wooden wheel for example just in case that would be a diverse solution to the problem um, and the the boron injection is diverse solution to the problem uh, yes the chainsaw then helps you to to develop redundant uh, solution a diverse solution on the spot but you need to know how to operate it now cutting off your leg would not be a solution to the problem okay <laughs> or even cutting off the wheel from the car it's also not a solution because you cannot drive on free independence huh what would an independence be any guesses Or if there is something which is redundant, let's start that way, okay? You have two, two systems which are completely the same. How are they when they are independent? The others, okay, they don't control or affect each other. So you typically would have a separate source of power, which could be even, again, redundant or diverse or you can have two separate diesel aggregates, uh, diesel generators on, on uh, supplying two different redundant systems. But this is a redundant solution. Diverse solution would be that you have something else also like batteries on the third system or something like that, okay? Uh, independence is also very, very important in the sense of levels of defense in depth. Now, uh, imagine what happens if you try to defend at different levels with the same system and this system fails. What does it mean? There is, well, there is no safety and security system and also you lost all three levels or all four levels in the same, in the single failure. That's violation of the first rule, you cannot afford that, it, it cannot happen. If you remember the Swiss cheese model of, uh, def of uh, defense in depth. So if you would align all, all the holes in all the cheese slices in the same place, then it's very easy to tunnel through and you have a failure, you don't have defense in depth in this case. Physical separation. That's famous wording for COVID. What do you gain with physical separation? The, the safety, COVID-19 safety is based on physical separation. Yep. If you put the same type of redundant systems apart, and one is destroyed by the airplane or something or fire, the other one is not. So physical separation matters sometimes also. Fire is typically the, the drill. Uh, now, maybe uh, uh, another infrastructure part of the story. So like uh safety or resilience requirements are here also for the for the railway networks for the highway networks for uh, for uh, uh, networks of uh, power lines for it networks but if you look in, in the in the nature you will see that at some point the electric line the highway and the railway line connect or go through the same spot 
What do you need to do if you would like to kick out all three of them? You just have to touch this spot. That's it. You kill the highway, you kill the electric line, and you kill the, the railway. So uh, this is also physical separation, and sometimes it's impossible to make it. Okay. Eventually, everything goes in, into the core. So closer to core you are, more, more difficult it is to really make a physical separation for the things. Fail safe. What does it, what would fail safe mean? Okay. Or for any reactor should be shut down without any problem, that's fail safe. Now, it ideally fail safe would be that it does it without anybody touching it. That's passive is ultimate way of making fail safe. Okay. Uh, but for a simple piece of equipment, let's call it a valve. Can you imagine what would be a fail safe position of a valve? Closed or open depends on the function, but you can, you can infer from the design, if there is no electricity, if there is no control, if nothing, then the, the, the valve goes automatically in the safe position. So the control rods go automatically in the safe, safe position if there is no electricity. What do they do? They drop down, okay? So the system is designed in a way, if there is no electricity, the reactor shuts down. Your tires on the car, are they fail safe? If it goes flat, is this a fail safe position? No. Can you buy a fail safe tire for a car? Yes. Some are puncture resistant. You, you can even have some compressed air pumped in in more expensive cars. Or you can buy a tire with some, some solid piece of, of rubber inside so you don't fall completely on the floor. So you can buy a fail safe tire, but it is what? More expensive. And it's a probability game you, you play at home. It's the risk game you play in this case. You can pay more and then you are, you are fail safe or you can pay less and then you call the, you call the, the support on the road if you, if you need it because you need it very rarely, then maybe the cost of the, of the uh, help on the road is much cheaper. Now in the nuclear safety, we don't go for the things which can be called upon if you are in trouble. You have to have it here already at the beginning. You have to, you, you have, to have a good tire at the beginning. Okay, then the passive, what would, what are control rods also passive? Yes, you don't need any action to do it. It just goes into the fail safe position passively without any, any uh, support from outside. But usually when we talk about passive systems today, uh, we, think about cooling the, the reactor by passive systems. What would be cooling by passive systems? Natural circulation. Do you think there is a, a lot of examples in technology? Not in technology yet, that there is, a, the, do we have natural cooling or natural uh, circulation heating somewhere for you, you are coming from hot countries. So you don't have a central heating usually installed in your, in your homes. Is that true? So here we have everywhere, it's central heating. And central heating, when I was a kid, the first central heating systems were without the pumps. Well, the pumps were very expensive at that time. You know, small electric car motor 40 years ago 
did not really exist. Now you have a very small and very efficient pumps which work forever and can run the, the central heating systems. In my uh, childhood, there were designed with a little bit uh, um, with larger pipes. And in the usual house, you, you have some 10 meters of the height difference and some 10 meters of height difference, it already starts to, to run the, the um, natural circulation. So you had to, to have a boiler to heat the water and the water would start to circle around the house without a pump. That was the good news. So you could save a very small amount on electricity, by the way, because these pumps are not very, very uh, uh, energetically difficult. But on the other hand, the problem was uh, that the force or the pressure difference, which was which was uh, forcing the fluid around, was actually very small. It was just enough to to force the fluid. So you had to have some, let's say, special techniques to get the water to each of the radiators. It was not very easy. If there was a little bit more resistant line by the Ohm's law, nothing came there. Now with the pumps, it goes. So we have a lot of experience, by the way, with passive systems in technology, not only in the, in the uh, uh, nuclear technology. Now, but probably at, at this point and in, in the next hour, we'll try also to solve this a little bit, but you will still stay confused. How do you know in which part of it you are? Is this could be completely separated or they come together. So single failure comes with redundancy or diversity and independence sometimes depends a little bit on the, on the failure. So they come together, they always come together. Not in completely all combinations, but they come together. You cannot really think, you cannot really put them uh, apart. Now, let's try to find some, still a few, a few uh, cases in real life of things which are diverse, redundant. Let's go to your car, the brakes in your car. Do you have diverse brake system, braking system in your car? Yes, you have diverse braking systems. Can we see how many diverse versions of the braking systems are there? Three, okay, number one. Which is the first one? Engine? Okay, then you have four actually. Then I can, I, can, I, I can sell you the fourth one. So one is the normal braking, the one is parking brake. It would help to stop the engine. You can brake on the engine by compression of the air. And the fourth one, you can you can use on the on the side the guardrail. You can use the friction. Now imagine that that's that's also the logic of defense in depth. You first you try the normal brake. If it works fine, if it does not work, then you try the parking brake. If it does not work, then you go for engine. And if nothing works, it's probably cheaper and definitely safer to brake your car, not yourself. Okay. So then you try some, some, and it, it also kind of uh, restores the logic of the, of the defense in depth and, and defense of the nuclear power plant. At the end, you break something to save something else, okay? But before you try everything else, any other, uh, when with the car brakes, do you see any redundancy in the normal braking system? Is there any redundancy? It's usually uh, the, the force goes from the pedal to the wheels through some uh, hydraulic fluid. If you lose hydraulic fluid, is the system defended against this in some way or not? If you can break and it's hard, then you, you lost the, the, the power. Uh, power pump or power support for the braking, that's okay. That's fail safe position, you can still brake. Uh, no, uh, you have that, sorry? Well, okay, 
but it could be also electric. But it's usually handbrake is 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 diverse. It's done on different way. But it's finally not independent because the friction part really doing the brake is the same. It's just other way to influence it. Now, um, if you have a car here and four wheels, the hydraulic braking system, uh, braking system actually goes in this way. There is a common reservoir of fluid, but you can lose only half of it. Okay. If the, the piping is broken, then you're usually losing one diagonal. The other one stays in power. That's the additional redundancy or some redundancy in the system. Then you have one half of the system working. It's usually, yes, it's usually like that. And you have two diag diagonal connections. So yes, if you break the container, you're out. That's the independence problem, okay? There is a part of the system which is dependent. <laughs> but if you lose the pipe, you only lose half of the system. And now you can usually stop, at least you can stop with half of the system. You know, I remember I had one of my, of my cars in the 90s, it was already electronic and had a first computer and blah, blah, blah. And I was driving towards Germany and it was a German car. At some point it started to, the, the computer started to shout to me, oh, you have, you have a failure of the braking system. Please stop immediately. Okay, that's the typical, uh, we are coming to something which was not mentioned here. And how do you convey the message to the operator? So I tried to stop, it was only the, the ABS controller was out. So the, again, it was the fail safe design. In most of the cars, if anti-block system goes, you can still stop, okay? So no, it's not that you lose all the brakes, you just lose the anti-braking part of the story. So I could stop. And then I tried what's the problem, a little bit of engineering, and I could drive all the all the all the 1000 kilometers without the ABS. But the message was, well, your braking system is down, please stop immediately. And that's a kind of optimistic message. We can start the, the brake with it. And then we continue with the details of the single failure. Okay. 15 minutes break. Now we are in the single failure mode. You have a typical picture of a single failure where all chains come together in a single in a single part of the chain. So you break this one, you lose all four chains. This is uh, why single failure is not okay. It's also the same at the same part uh, time. It's a nice example of how redundant sim uh, systems can fail because of uh, uh, not being independent. You have a one piece which goes to all the systems. They all fail at the same time. Now, which is which is the piece? Uh, imagine also maintenance and people affect the systems. Which is the part where you always have a kind of uh, dependent influence on the on the systems in your nuclear power plant? Is it the maintenance stuff? They would tend to do the things in the same manner, the same on all the systems. So if they make a mistake on the system number one, they will do most probably the same mistake also on the system two. So you have a kind of a common cause or dependent problem. But we are not here. Uh, the, well, the, single, the single failure means you should prevent by design that any component or system which fails 
kills your machine. Machine should run or at least be uh, successfully stopped, stopped, shut down without any single system. This is also so the same, the same principle was taken actually. It was not invented by the nuclear people. It was in, invented or it's still very powerful in power grids. They don't call it single failure. They, they call it N minus one system. So you have N components. You should operate with minus one at any time. But just one, two, you're in trouble, okay? Now, but we are engineers, okay? So whatever we say, if we, we design against single failure, how many failures you think must occur in this system typically for it really to fail? One is not enough. If you designed it completely, there must be at least one. How many? Two? Five is a good number. Two is a small number. Usually it goes up to five. It, it fails at about five. You will have some time, some some uh, lectures on probabilistic safety analysis. Those guys actually put all the components and safety systems with some probabilities and logical and functional links into a computer, and they they got out uh, something which they call minimum cut sets. So the smallest sets of equipment which must fail for the machine to fail. It's typically five or six or larger for a nuclear power plant designed um, against single failure. Now, how to illustrate this uh, in a non-nuclear world, maybe? Uh, you are probably too young to remember uh, that there were only a very few accidents of fast trains in, in the world. Only very few. Chinese had one, Spanish had one, Germans had one, and this German is very interesting. Um, how it developed, and it also shows this type of uh, five, four or five or more uh, single failures. So it went this way. The wheels of the, of the, of the, the trains are made of two parts. It's a little bit more soft inner part and hard wheel uh, at the border, which, which actually touches the, the, the rail to minimize the, the uh, losing of material. It's hard, but hard materials are typically brittle, so the, the core is not brittle, it's uh, tough. Okay, so it had a crack and this crack at some point break open. So the, the part of the wheel, it's, it's a big part, it's like this, straightened and went into the, the carriage. There was a guy sitting in the carriage and he lost his eyebrow. That, that was all, very, very cheap. He lost the eyebrow, nothing else. But the, uh, the, the piece of metal from the wheel stayed uh, stuck in the, in, the, in the carriage and it kicked how is the, the separation of tracks called? There is a special device which makes... Uh, uh, so it happens that because, because this uh, piece of steel was uh, kicking a, a mechanism on the rails, that the second part of the train way went on the neighboring rail. So the train was traveling on two rails at the same time. So the first failure was losing the wheel, the part of the wheel. The second failure was it stuck it didn't fall apart, it stuck in, in the carriage. The third one was it changed the, the, the switch, it's called switch. So the second half of the train went on the other, uh, other rail. And then in, eventually, because uh, at least one carriage was kind of uh, driving sideways, it kicked into the uh, bridge, into one of the pillars of the bridge. And this, this was number five, and bridge collapsed. This was number six. And then this, of course, the second half of the train stopped in, in the bridge. And that was a big, a big, uh, big accident. Everything else before each of them and all together were kind of oops situation, okay? 
it's unpleasant, but we can stop the train and we can we can resolve the problem and we can continue. It was the last bridge failing down, which was number six in the single failure design, which actually caused a really tragical consequences. Now, how do you do? So that's why I say it's, it's principally in aviation. In aviation, they have everything is, is redundant. It's, it's diverse. Uh, do, do you remember, well, the typical aviation problem is losing, if you lose the engines, then you have to glide, but that's not the most dangerous thing at the moment. You also lose all the electricity in, in this. Uh, now, do you know what are alternative ways of getting electricity to get the instruments and to get some of the, of the hydraulic control of the flight surfaces? Yeah, you can't, you lose the motors. Yes, the, the ultimate one is small wind turbine which flops down and then it's a propeller rolling on the, on the airflow. But there is an intermediate one, all of them have it and the guy uh, landing on the Hudson River. He actually switched on the emergency power supply without a procedure. Procedure didn't ask him to switch on the power supply when he loses the, the um, the both engines and he did it so he could he was able to use all the instruments and all the support of the airplane until the end it's a, a wrong procedure it so, sometimes happens okay he, uh, information technology has the same type of thinking internet is is this type of networks so it doesn't matter which way it goes. As long as there is any way, it will find it and it will go through. Okay. Now, if we want to have single failure design, design, then we have to go to a combinations of redundancy, diversity, independence, physical separation, fail safe, and also passive. Uh, well, passive per se is not a single failure uh, feature, uh, but it's a good way to do it. You see, this is a very simple solution to a single failure. Okay, you see it, you can imagine what, why this is a good solution for a single failure. You get at least a warning if you look at it and it will actually sustain some force until the very end. The other one, this one, when it breaks, you lose it. Uh, so this is this is how, uh, uh, like in in the where, where people are using some ropes or something uh, or metal ropes, they would usually they will be usually put uh, uh, as a set of small wires together, just like this one. This is a a single failure prone design. Now redundancy. It's the same solution, but repeated. So one way is that you have two pumps like here and each of them is enough to run your system. Okay. So that would be logic that you need one out of two. Could be the logic one out of four or two out of four unite you you will find different things around um, everywhere so for the second generation of nuclear power plants like Kershko it's usually one out of two or sometimes two out of three depends a little bit on the plant but it's mostly one out of two and for the generation three, like EPR and stuff which is being built today, it's typically more around one out of four. We'll see some examples around. Um, now, what is the probabilistic gain if you have one out of two or one out of four? How reliable 
a system can be and reliable, very uh, uh, ideally reliable system has a reliability of 100%. What is a very reliable system? How much would the reliability be? How do you think? It cannot be 100%, that's for sure. Uh, 95 is a good measure for diesel generators. 95, uh, they say for diesel generators, 95 is nearly perfect. Now for some electronic systems, you would hear four nines or five nines, 99.99 or 90.999. Uh, the issue here is, and this will be also demonstrated, I guess, to you during the, the probabilistic safety uh, 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 analysis, that if you have a, a uh, sequence of elements in a system, each of these elements is unreliable in the sense it's only 99 or point something. So if you put them consequently and all of them have to perform the function, the total reliability of the system decreases if you add another, another, another part of the system. So if you put more and more and more and more of, of uh, active components in the system, reliability must go down. It's no way to go up. Except redundancy, which is a parallel. It's not consecutive uh, connection, it's parallel. But then, so if this is, if the probability is uh, that it will work, each of them is 99 and you need one of two, 99%, you need one of two or one out of four. What is your gain in the total probability if they are really independent? Yeah, but this will still not be very much. You don't gain a 1%. So the one out of four is there, it's expensive, and it is not really bringing a lot directly, but it is bringing a lot indirectly through physical separation and independence and stuff like that. Now, this is the French EPR, the, the largest reactor at, at the moment in, in construction. Two of them are operating in China. One is in construction in Olkiloto, one in France, Olkiloto, Finland, one in Flamanville, France. What they say is they have four redundancy on the main safety systems, four train redundancy, and each of them is in a different colored building. So it's separation. It's redundancy. It's also, in some sense, independence because they have uh, different diesel generators for them. And you see two ultimate containment heat removal systems, so redundant, and on the other side of the building, which is physical separation. So it turns out that if you crash the airplane on this reactor, you cannot destroy all of them. Okay, this is the physical separation. You put it in, in, such a, in such a position that you cannot destroy all of them. With one aircraft, of course, with two or three. So there is no 100% safety. That's what I'm telling you. You cannot invest more money and be more safe. Well, to some extent, you can invest more money and be more safe, but you cannot invest, invest enough money to be fully safe. This is another example. This is the also from EPR uh, auxiliary feed water. This is the feed water. The feed water is coming to the steam generator. So when you need the feed water for the cooling, this assumes that the primary system is in the natural circulation mode. So the heat goes from the uh, from the core to the steam generators, but then you need to put to to chill the steam generators in a way. So it has redundancy of four. Each of those systems has its own pool or uh, some, some uh, quantity of water available. Each of them has a pump and a direct line into, into the steam generator. What is an additional feature here? Look, these are connections of the lines. And one is before the pump, one is behind the pump. 
which helps you to connect any of the pools with any of the pumps. So this is how you get uh, some additional reliability of the system. You don't really need the entire train to work, but you need to work the one pump to be working. You need one storage to be working, and then you can connect each of them. And with a little bit of luck, it doesn't matter which steam generator you chill. You just need to chill one of them, OK? But if all of them are working, no problem. Usually, uh, these, these four, four redundant systems are designed in generation four that they will take one of them will take the load. And this is for EPR. Yeah. OK. Uh, do all the pumps work all the time? No. And this is a safety system. So this uh, this sim system comes in only if needed. OK. That's uh, the purpose. Most of the time, it's uh, not actually operating. Uh, th this puts a little bit of uh, another, another interesting feature. Now, uh, let's go. It's like a reserve wheel in your car. You only need it occasionally. So what do you do to be sure it will work when you need it? You need to test it occasionally, yes. If you stop and you take an empty reserve wheel out of the uh, your car, then you are done. So take care of the safety systems. The feature is that they are there, but they are not working at all just during the tests. And they need to be tested, 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 tested. But actually, there are usually requirements that they have to pass the test. If they don't pass the test, they must be repaired until they pass the test. And there is also some rule uh, in the aviation, they call it minimum configuration. And in nuclear power plants, there is also a kind of a minimum configuration rule in the technical specification. That's one of the documents you will also learn a little bit about at the end of the course. So if not enough equipment, safety equipment is available, proven by the tests, you cannot start the plant or you have to shut down the plant. You have to have not all, but enough safety systems. The pilots call it minimum configuration. The nuclears, they don't really call it minimum configuration, but I like the, 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 uh, the wording because it's essentially tells you uh, what you need to know. You can't really, well, imagine you can't drive really your car without gasoline. That's the minimum configuration uh, question. You can do it without a license. That's theoretically possible. It's illegal, but it's possible. But without gasoline, it doesn't work. If it's not electric car, then it does. <laughs> Diversity. So he, here we approach the same function with different means. Why do we like diversity? Yep. In a way, prevents the common mode failure, yes. So if, if diversity is in the power source, like Let's, let's stress this example again, Contour, Rots, and Boric Exit. That's a very good example. It's diverse way of doing the same thing. Is there any other way you, shut, you can shut down the reactor also? At least in theory. Yeah, you don't have Contour, Rots, you don't have Boric Exit. What do you do? Yeah. So you lose all the water. Does it stop the the chain reaction? The, uh, <laughs> the fuel melted down. Uh, in principle, it should stop. Yes, the the chain reaction because it's kind of configuration based. But it's sufficient that you lose all the water. 
you lose the moderator, you're okay. So from the chain reaction perspective, you're okay without the water. Now from the cooling perspective, are you okay? No. <laughs> then you melt the core. <laughs> but you can stop the chain reaction actually. Yeah? You know, after Fukushima, um, uh, actually the same year, uh, uh, in, in October of the same year, I was in Japan and then was a nice conference on nuclear safety. And the guy who designed uh, designed the, the reactors in Fukushima, the boiling water reactors, uh, his name was Solomon Levy. Solomon was still alive and walking around and he had a nice lecture about how to preserve the Fukushima reactors before the accident or during the accident at this conference. And he was maybe 90 years of age at that time, you know, a guy of, uh, very well known, very well respected around. And he said simply, you know, it says it's a water reactor, it's boiling, but it's water reactor. So you have to put water in, put water in, that's all you need to do. Doesn't matter which way, that's why the diversity, just get the water in, could be salty water, yes, water, put the water in, okay. Another expect uh, diversity is electricity. You need electricity that's for control, for information. Um, one of the issues in Fukushima was they didn't see the instruments. They didn't have information about what's going on in the plant. You lose everything, you know, without electricity. So uh, it's the only old fashioned shouting, hey, yeah, the, the, the network of, uh, Mobile phones was down, everything. So communication is really, really, really difficult. So electric, you need electricity. How do you have it? In, in Kursko, for example, in Slovenia nuclear plant, you have power grids, many of them. We said Kursko. It's actually, I think, four lines to Maribor. There are four lines to Zagreb. There are four lines to Ljubljana, to Bericevo. So it's already eight, uh, what? 12 lines. Each of 400 kilovolt line is capable of taking roughly one gigawatt of electricity. So each of them is more than enough for Kershko nuclear power plant, okay? So it's eight time redundancy on the power lines. And then this is 400 kilo, then it's 110 kilovolt. I think there are about 10 to 12 connected to the, to the uh, uh, nuclear power plant. And what, this is taking roughly 300 megawatts of electricity. So it's good to, to get the 40 in, the safety 40 or needed 40 in. For safety features in such a plant, you need about four megawatts. So 40 for full operation to start and it will give you 700. Uh, so it's more than 20 times redundancy there. Of course, this works until the entire system fell apart, that's the independence uh, problem. Then there is a possibility to connect a gas, cool, a gas uh, uh, thermal power plant nearby about five, six kilometers away, Brestanica with a direct line. And there are maybe three or four possibilities for this connection, direct connection. If this doesn't work, they have diesel generators two safety, another one nearly safety. And there are many mobile in the plant. So you take a two a megawatt uh, diesel generator, you bring it there. And there are batteries for four or eight hours, depending on the function. So this is usually sufficient to survive at least this connection to be established, okay? This is diversity in the source of electricity, but it's still electricity and electricity can be a problem of independence on the system. So if you don't have electricity, uh, it's a little bit different. Now, uh, a diverse feed water auxiliary or emergency feed water system. So again, the assumption here is that the primary system is in the, in the natural circulation, you have to chill down the steam generator on the secondary side. This is a redundancy four system, but it only has two tanks, okay? You see the, the, the small difference, the previous had four tanks, this was has only two. 
But again, these two tanks can be connected to any of the, of the pumps. And there are two types of pumps. In the middle are electric motor driven pumps and on the sides are turbine, steam turbine driven pumps. It employs this thinking as if your reactor will be heating up, it will be able to produce steam. If it's able to produce steam, you can drive the pump through steam. So it's diverse and it's independent of the electricity. Ah, not always. This uh, turbine driven steam pumps, they need a little bit of control. So they usually need a little bit of electricity. They are trying to get out rid of this electricity, but let's say batteries will do. It's not a big amount of electricity, but they need electricity. It's again the same drill. You see all the pump, all the ways you can connect the pump with the, with the tank, any pump with any tank and any pump with any of the steam generators uh, on the top. There is another feature. If you look, these butterflies are valves, okay? You will see that every valve is in two. There are two valves at each place. Here are two, this one and this one are two. Functionally, there are always two valves. Why are there always two valves? Single failure. Single failure uh, resistant design requires, you have always two valves. They can be redundant or they can be diverse. They are diverse. This one is check valve. So it check valve says it can flow there, but not back. That's why there are always two valves. If it needs to be closed or uh, by, by safety reasons at some point. Okay, independence should be independent from the manufacturer. By the way, if you, if you go for really, really strict manufacturer, buy it at another manufacturer, make another uh, maintenance team taking care of the system, make another team of operators take care of this system. But usually it's on the technical level, independence that the, the, the we saw that there, are, there were connections between different lines before. So you could connect any, any reservoir of water with any of the pumps. Uh, this is also a little bit of the contribution of the independence. So if you have four reservoirs and you can connect each pump to each of the four reservoirs, it, you don't depend only on one reservoir, you depend on four reservoirs. But if they have the same manufacturer and the same problem, I have a German car, you know, I, I had a lot of German cars and they had the following dependence problems. When one uh, main uh, light bulb went out, it was only the matter of an hour or something that the second main uh, bulb went out. So they were so, uh, so good made with so good quality assurance, they were out in about one hour. That was not a very good idea. So it was nearly impossible already to change the bulb on the road. You had to take the car to the, to the, to the, uh, uh, to, to the uh, shop to do it. So losing one bulb during the night was a nightmare then because the second followed. That's the dependence and independence problem. Now, Again, independence is especially important when you are dealing with equipment, taking care of different levels of defense. Why? Again, it happens sometimes that, that when we are doing some licensing uh, support for the Kershko, they try to sell the same equipment as being good for level of defense number three and level of defense number four. We usually say no go, why? Because, yeah, because of independence. Can you elaborate it? Yeah, 
yes. If the, the equipment is broken, you lose both levels at the same time. So there is no defense in depth in such a case. Most of the time. <laughs> It's not our decision, it's the decision of the operator, primary responsibility for safety, and decision of the regulator at the end, who is supervising the operator. We are just advisor uh, in such case. Okay, so please take care of this. Uh, this is, I think, very important theoretical, theoretical piece of information. Now, uh, this independence of the, of the uh, level of defense system, especially in electronics, and this is the, the uh, instrumentation and control system of Atmea. By the way, Atmea is, is uh, a joint venture of Japanese Mitsubishi and Framatom. Uh, but the, the, this was issue of EPR in Finland. They wanted to have the same hardware for uh, instrumentation and control the same wiring, not necessarily the same uh, same printed uh, boards, but the same wiring for normal and emergency part of the operation. So for different safety level levels. And the Finnish regulator said, no, cannot go that way. And it cost because of the redesign and all the rewiring and blah, blah. It cost in part a few years of delay and these few years of delay are measured in, in billions, I think uh, of uh, dollars. So you have you have its level by level, and function by function separation, and independence. Now uh, another dependence or independence issue would be if you rely on the river, on the same river, for all types of emergency cooling. Why can it happen that the river disappears? Is this for Sava River? Is this that's a question for Slovenians? Is this probable or is it impossible? In your country, river disappearing is not so not so common or <laughs> well, it's not completely improbable. It happened not to Sava, it happened to Savinia, just downstream of uh, Rimske to Plice, that's for Slovenes, maybe 150 years ago that the, the rocks dropped down in the valley and, and created a dam, a local dam. And if you look at the, at the Sava Valley through Trbole, Zagoria, Hrasnik, it's, it's really, really brittle rocks on both sides. Also the, uh, the railway, they, they have a very nice, uh, nice uh, warning system. So just a few, a few wires. If they get, if they get broken, the railway system has a note. Oh, we have a problem with the rocks falling. So in principle, the the hill can drop into Sava River and damn it. So what they, what then the, the Sava River is lost. What is the solution in Kershko? Somebody knows there is a solution for this problem. Uh, yeah, but the cooling tower still need water from the river, le but much less, but still. Uh, well, okay, you shut down the machine, so you, you go to the residual heat, that's the, the first assumption. Well, but they have them. They have them, and now uh, uh, in the last two years, there is also a, a bridge, it's a hydropower plant downstream, which has the level of water already high enough for Kershko to take it out. So you have, a, you create a lake and you're using this lake uh, to get some heat out of the, of the plant to the air, of course. We, you lose some water, you have to rely on, on a few smaller streams to bring in some little, little bit of water to do it. But it's again, redundant and diverse and independent solution. Now for the post Fukushima thing, they are using the underground water. So they are creating the wells so they can pump underground water, which is technically different water than Sava River, at least in the, in the time frame of years or something like that.
Physical separation. We already mentioned the EPR, EPR, that's EPR, the French design. You have four different buildings for the for the housing of of safety trains, uh, safety uh, trains pumping in the safety injection water, and this is huge, by the way. I think the the diameter is uh, in the order of 100 meters or something like that, and the the height of the containment is also. 70, 80, something. So it's huge, and you can not really destroy all of them at the same time from the outside event. It's not very easy to do it. That's the meaning of physical separation. The second one is, so let me repeat, the fire. You don't want to put the, the uh, piping or cables of two redundant system in the same room because of fire. Then you have to put some fire barrier in between or something like that. And this is another approach to emergency feed water. It's not really, uh, it, it relies on free, uh, free uh, redundancy of free and his free pools with offside filling. You see each of them has some additional way of, of getting water in. Again, free pumps and there is possibility to connect and to recirculate. This one has even a recirculation lines, so you can pump the water from one to another if, if you configure the system. Um, it's usually uh, even a little bit more complex uh, than that in real life, but this is the, the, the schematics. And you can get into each of the steam generators again through any combination of the uh, source and the pump and steam generator. And you can still see double double uh, valves, at least double valves everywhere, okay? Fail safe. You lose the electricity, it must go into safe position. Now there is a bunch of valves called uh, insulation valves. So the containment, uh, you have a lot of pipes uh, going through the containment. And if you would like to prevent anything going out of the containment, you need to close it. And then you close all the pipes uh, which are going through the containment, except those you need for the safety systems. This you have to open. Okay, so there is a set of pipes you need to close. For those, the valves fail safe position is closed. And then it's a set of pipes you would need to open, like safety systems, so the water can go in. For those, the, the fail-safe position of the valves is open. It's functional requirement. And ultimately, fail-safe is a passive system. Now, let's talk a little bit of the passive systems. They are not really uh, a solution for every problem you have. No, unfortunately not. In principle, they, they are driven without external power by na natural forces. Gravity, the change in the density or the difference in density in fluids, it's again gravity driven. Gravity is a good, is there anything else? A natural force used for uh, driving the passive systems in the nuclear power plant. Gravity. Sorry? Passive. Yeah, for passive. There is, of course, at the, at the end, somebody has to move it. Say it louder. Yeah, natural, natural circulation is gravity driven at the end also because of the difference in density. But be careful, power might be needed for Reconfiguration. So safety systems are not active during normal operation. Okay, so they are disconnected from the from the plant. So if you get in trouble, you have to change the setting of the valves. I just mentioned before there was a fail-safe position of of valves in the normal operation. On normal systems, they close. In the in the safety system, they need to open to enable the safety systems to to get. Uh, way to put the, the water in the reactor. Now, this needs power. 
the American uh, AP-1000 design has explosives in the valves to do that, okay? Yep. What's a diverse source of energy? Well, the valves could be operated by electric, uh, well, pneumatic, hydraulic, explosives. Well, the explosives, they only work once. That's the, the drawback. And something else, or springs for fail safe or something. And you need to start the, the, the uh, passive systems needs to be started. But the issue is that the, the, the forces of natural circulations are very small compared to pumps and stuff like that. They, they are sufficient to get the heat out, but they need the, the, the circulation needs to start. Not always easy and not always straightforward, okay? So you need some, one of the Westinghouse guys when the AP1000 came out was funny. He said, well, you know, we have passive systems and we have some issues with the activation of passive systems. Remember this one, we still have issues with the activation of passive systems. By the way, were passive systems available in generation two? Yes. Uh, at least uh, Fukushima unit one, the, the boiling water of uh, General Electric, the small one, the first one, had a nice passive system. It looks like more or less the same as this one in, in, uh, in the Westinghouse AP1000. So you have a pool of water, which serves as a heat sink. And then you have some piping taking water out of the primary system and uh, by natural circulation, bringing it into the heat exchanger, which is placed in the pool. Very similar system was put into unit one of Fukushima originally in the 60s. Not in two and three, but in one it was. It didn't work because of misconfiguration of the valves. So it was there, but it was not used. Now in AP1000, which is claimed to be nearly completely passive, they're using the same type of the system. So you have a large pool. So you evaporate this water slowly. You know that the, the, the uh, latent heat of evaporation of water is very large. So you can, you can dissipate a lot of energy through evaporating the water. Two megajoules roughly per kilogram. So a lot. And there is a lot of other uh, passive systems like accumulators. Accumulators are pre-pressured, pre-pressurized nitrogen is inside. And when the pressure, that's also semi-passive actuation, when the pressure in the, the primary system is uh, low enough, the accumulator will start pushing the fluid, fluid in. This is a, a easy one. Again, this one, recirculation, uh, uh, recirculation of water into some, some uh, uh, Heat exchanger in the pool needs to be needs to be uh, reconfigured. You have to open the valves, and then the process has to start. Also, you see that uh, in this Westinghouse design, the depressurization valves, which take over the the, uh, is again dissipating the heat from the primary system by letting the the high pressure steam out. But it's taken into the, the pool, into the sparger, and it's condensed and chilled there. So the water is always coming here. That's how, how the, the pool is always full of the water. We need to go just a little bit into the typical safety systems in the nuclear power plant. This is generation two, the old one, like Kershko. So Typically, we'll have control rods, number one. Second one is high pressure and low pressure safety injection, number two. Take care, 
the generation two has the storage of this water with boron outside. Uh, one of the issues with the outside water is that the boron starts uh, starts to to crystallize at low temperatures, so this must be heated outside. This water is actually heated slightly, and the pipelines are also heated, not to get the boron crystals. Uh, in in way of of uh, flow or in not enough boron have, uh, having enough boron in the in the reactor then there is there are accu uh, accumulators for emergency core cooling so we have control rods for reactivity control we have systems for core cooling core cooling is primary issue and then we have auxiliary feed water system coming into the steam generators we looked into a few of them because they are nicely redundant and diverse uh, before, where you rely on the natural circulation in the in the primary system. Now, do you have an idea how tall um, the steam generators are? Or in other way, other way of putting the question, what is the height difference which is pushing the natural circulation of the water in the primary system? Uh, more, more than ten. 15 about 15 you need to really to, to to run it number five safety valves of reactor coolant system functions are two first one if you would over pressurize the system the, the system will will explode don't do that you need to have to have a relief valve you have it in your boiler at home so look at it there is a relief valve it will not blow. And in, if you have this uh, fast cooking uh, devices with pressurized cooking, they also have relief valves. The second thing is that uh, again, the discharging water and steam out of this, again, uh, helps you with two megajoules per kilogram of dissipating the heat from the system. The, the good news is that works until you have the fluid in it. But when you don't have the fluid in it, then you have to put some more. Usually, you know, the, the containment is designed in the way that uh, that all this water going out by breaks or whatever will collect finally at the bottom and you can recycle it. That's uh, another feature. Although this water here is not actually meant for recycling. We'll, we'll touch it on the other uh, uh, on the other slide. Containment sprays to chill the containment to condense the steam if you get this makes a lot of steam in the containment containment is designed to take the entire primary system of uh, of water turned into steam the volume factor is about three orders of magnitude by the way so from one liter of water you get 1000 liters of steam it's designed to do it but still you have sprays to condense and chill the steam and it will again be here, come here, and then it can be reused. And seven is the outside refueling water storage tank with boron exit. We touched this one before. Uh, Post Fukushima improvements are related to design extension conditions or decks. We have two types of systems. Uh, one is to prevent core melt. This is wet cavity. Actually, we collect water below the, the uh, pressure vessel hopefully to reach the pressure vessel and to chill it from the outside. So if the core melts, it will finally relocate down in the bottom of the, of the pressure vessel. And if you can chill it from the outside, it will stay in. That's the theory. It's called in-vessel retention approach. Ivo Klinak will take you through this a little bit more. The other one is EPR, X-vessel. You drop it and you chill it outside. Uh, and then another one is additional safety injection, yet redundant, diverse way of putting water into the primary system. And the third one is filtered containment venting. So it's a kind of pressure relief valve for the containment with the filters, taking iodine and cesium and the volatile species in. I leave you then for the homework to figure out what's much different now in the EPR, except that this boron 
water tank is moved inside of the containment. So it's protected also from the from the airplane crash or outside events. And in the passive AP1000. In the summary, we discussed today single failure, redundancy, diversity, independence, physical separation, fail safe and passive systems. And please don't forget that there is mostly a combination of them in place all the time. Thank you very much. Any emergency or immediate questions, urgent questions, I like to say urgent questions. Good. So see you on Zoom tomorrow, 12 and a few minutes, 12, 15. Thank you.